We're so privileged today, again, for three minutes, I'll be, you know, I'm inviting Eldin Ivory, who is the husband to the judge. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So you just heard it from uh, Philip, who is saying that people in the diaspora should get interested in uh, investing money in treasury bills and bonds because Bank of Uganda is secure. To get it from you, uh, what, what are the available investment opportunities and what are your thoughts around investing in treasury bills and bonds? so that you can start from there and then broaden your conversation in terms of what advice do you give to people in the diaspora who want to invest money back home. Uh, Eldin, you're welcome. All right, so good afternoon uh, to my friend Mir and the across the ocean. Um, I'm Eldin Ibri, and yes, I am the husband of the judge. I'm <laughs> um, from Toronto, but we currently reside in uh, Niagara Lake, Ontario, um, which is um, a small town adjacent to Niagara Falls, Canada. Uh, so some of you might be familiar with Niagara Falls, but it pales in comparison to uh, some of the beautiful falls I know of in, in Africa. Um, so I'm a wealth management advisor and consultant. I've been in the financial services industry since 1999, where I started my career working for a trust company. Then I transitioned to securities trading before going into private practice in 2002. Um, I hold both the securities and insurance licenses to offer a range of products. Um, which include mutual funds, life insurance, travel insurance, as well as many alternative investments. Um, I primarily, primarily helped uh, my clients with investment related decisions, um, but in 2008, I rebranded myself as a cash flow specialist, uh, focusing on investment yields, tax strategies, and debt management. So during this time, I also helped uh, Canadian businesses obtain superior group benefits for their employees at a cost-effective premium. Uh, that's um, adding to their bottom line. So in recent years, I've been helping individuals and institutions get ahead um, by uh, sharing with them strategic la labor market information and anticipating trends. So um, today's talk is um, accessing Canada through uh, education and investment. So it's important to understand the various levels of education in Canada to understand the opportunities that present themselves. Um, in Canada, we start off with elementary school education, which is from kindergarten to grade eight, which is roughly age four to age 14, uh, depending on when you're born in year. Uh, then we trans children transition to secondary education, uh, which is grade nine to 12, roughly 14 to 18. And then if a child is interested in attending university, they would use their average uh, among specified grade 12 courses. Um, and grade 12 courses are divided into two streams, academic, so if a student's objective is university, they must enroll in academic courses. If the student's objective is a college of like arts and technology stream, but for our purposes, it's a college stream, uh, then they would use the average of their applied grade 12 course. So students that wish to apply to the college stream may also use academic courses to be considered since academic courses have a higher standard than applied courses. Each college and university has determined their own expectations based on course demand, income potential, and program difficulty. In Canada, we have a third stream referred to as the apprenticeship stream. For example, in Ontario, which has the most developed apprenticeship program system, there are over 140 registered degrees, such as plumber, electrician, Students that are interested in pursuing a trade would seek employment after secondary school with an employer that would sponsor them in a specified trade. Apprenticeship normally takes three to five years and comprises of on-the-job learning, which is roughly 80% of the time, and in-class learning, which is roughly 20% of the time. Apprenticeship trades are divided into four categories, construction, industrial, service, and motive power. The province significantly subsidizes the in-class education so that students are only paying anywhere from 400 to $600 $600 per year for up to three years. Um, and just for our purposes here, um, in Canada, we refer to anything after secondary school as post-secondary. So any training after secondary school is referred to as post-secondary. So uh, let's see how, where these opportunities present themselves. For those of you in the Ugandan community that are considered wealthy, you have an option of sending your children to Canada to enroll in secondary education. Um, secondary education is a prerequisite to college and university. 
Um, if you choose to send them to secondary education uh, in the form of a private boarding school, some examples are here in my very town. We got Vine Ridge Academy. Um, Academy. Uh, their website is uh, vineridge.ca or Ridley College in St. Catharines um, and their uh, web address is ridleycollege.com. Um, but there's dozens of um, these private boarding schools across Canada. So your children would be in a Canadian learning environment that would make the transition to college or university that much easier. Um, it is important to be aware that the annual um, tuition for private boarding schools can range anywhere from 30 to 75,000 per year. So, however, um, but acceptance to post-secondary is much easier when applying from a Canadian secondary school. Um, it was just under 50 years ago that Canada had one of the lowest post-secondary rates among any OECD um, country. So the Canadian government um, back at the time in the 70s decided to heavily invest in their university system. Um, with strong messaging being sent out throughout the um, school system that university should be your primary post-secondary option if you're at all capable. The government also from the 70s to about the 90s gave very generous grants to help students offset the cost of tuition, books and related expenses. Albeit successful by any objective measure, there was a negative ramification that resulted from the Canadian government's initiative to increase university rates. Um, so while the government did develop some high quality universities, they had the indirect effect of drawing students away from the other two post-secondary options, which are college and apprenticeship training. This reality has exacerbated over the last few years, which gives an opportunity to foreign born students looking to come to Canada. So I will state, I'm not a legal professional, I leave that around to my wife, but um, I will give the strategy and depending on what you decide, you can either come contact me directly for additional assistance, or you can now present what I, I mentioned to you to your immigration lawyer. So uh, many students in Canada are not interested in pursuing apprenticeship because the work is seen as either hard or may lack status. However, most trade related jobs pay very well. Um, so the specifics of, so however, if you could obtain certification in one of the high demand trades, and this is something you can contact me uh, directly about, um, in your home country, then you could potentially apply to Canada um, with proof of your certification from your home country in um, these trades that we have a significant shortage. Um, our firm also has a program that we refer to as the Maximum Education Program, where we use um, assessment, assessment um, criteria to determine a field that either your child or you, the applicant, uh, would help determine what you would enjoy that, that also meets the demand of the Canadian labor market. So for those that would want to retain me after, this approach is ideal to access, um, access the college and university programs in Canada. Uh, you may not have known this, but Canada has a, gov a government department that compiles, aggregates, and analyzes a plethora of data. According to Statistics Canada, most Ugandans live in, in order, Ontario, Alberta, and then British Columbia, um, which may give you a starting point to consider for post-secondary programs. However, you may not have known that in terms of percentages, there are more Ugandans in Northwest Territories than anywhere else. Now, uh, if you know anything about Canada, I am definitely not necessarily suggesting that you move it there anytime soon uh, because the climate can be quite harsh uh, and you may hate me if you ever go up there, especially during the winter. Um, but if you are willing to uh, re re relocate, uh, there may be opportunities for those that are willing to move outside of a major ur urban center. Um, Statistics Canada data is um, compiled every five years. So the information I shared with you is from 2016. Um, but I did hear um, on a conference call I had last week with the Chamber of Commerce that there are also a number of Ugandans in Saskatchewan. So investment opportunities. Uh, there are several investment opportunities in Canada, but I'll just touch on a few. Um, we could be here uh, for quite a long time. So I'm just uh, here to spark a degree of interest with you. Uh, so unlike the United States, there are very few hospitable places to live in Canada. This is why our population density is only four persons per square kilometer. Uh, this reality presents another opportunity in real estate, in, in this case, specifically college and or university towns. So for example, there's the University of Regina in Regina, Saskatchewan. You can purchase a two bedroom condo for 160,000. 
if you were to put down 25%, which is $40,000, and then take out a mortgage of $120,000, um, assuming a 30-year amortization and a 4% interest rate, your monthly cost would only be $575 per month. Uh, rent in Regina is considerably higher than that. So um, whether it's for your own children or a group of children or members of the community, you have an opportunity now where you're potentially investing in uh, Canadian real estate, but um, you're also um, receiving the cash flow from the rent from your student tenants as well as the capital appreciation from your properties. Um, if you would only put down 10%, in my example, which is $16,000, uh, your monthly cost would only increase to $690 a month. So many real estate investors have leveraged the reality of Canadian real estate and low interest rates to offer student affordable housing while paying down the mortgage. Um, it is important to be aware of the risks of having unsupervised young people renting uh, property out that you own. But if you keep your tenants within the community or through word of mouth, you mitigate that risk. I will say that um, Canada has some pretty strict um, uh, tenant uh, rental laws. So you just have to be mindful that, uh, of how you market uh, to a tenant because you, um, uh, you can't just arbitrarily decide not to rent to somebody. Um, so not only do uh, students pay down your mortgage over time, uh, but you would also, like I said, benefit from capital appreciation of the property which can be uh, also leveraged with your bank. Um, our firm um, has another program that we refer to as the Maximum Cash Flow Program that allows investors to earn above average interest rate returns of 10% per annum. Typically, we've used this strategy for retirees that are now trying to support their lifestyle after they've, after they've stopped active employment. Um, and sometimes for active investors that are looking to park their money until the next investment opportunity presents itself. However, for those of you that want to support somebody while they're in post-secondary, uh, just to give you an idea of what type of returns we're looking at. Um, so the minimum uh, locking in period, if you want to use that term, is um, one year. A lump sum investment of $100,000 would pay you uh, over $800 Canadian per month. Um, and then there's many ways we could set this up. But um, one thing I would recommend, and we can have a further discussion about this, is where several community members or business sponsors could create a fund that simply recycles and sends members of the community through post-secondary um, here in Canada. And other communities have used a, a strategy similar to this uh, with quite success, um, mainly from uh, Asian countries. So, uh, you know, that's, that's definitely one option. Um, something that we also want to explore as well I understand that um, the Uganda community has quite uh, the skill sets or um, expertise in the healthcare industry. So many of you may know that Canada has an aging population. Here in Canada, um, healthcare is a provincially regulated um, uh, uh, sector. So what could be done is you could apply, do the research and you could apply to um, run a long-term care facility which potentially could either A, um, provide employment for um, members of the community, or you can go to, a, you could actually just locate in an under, underserved location and, um, and provide uh, long-term care uh, needs to that, um, that community, wherever that may be. Um, I know with, with our people, uh, long-term care is uh, somewhat uh, taboo. It's not something that uh, any good children would consider uh, doing for their kids, uh, or that's the belief anyway. But as many of us start to adopt a North American lifestyle, unfortunately, we start to um, attract you know, North American type Ill illnesses. So um, many members of my community have found that they're having trouble managing the care of their elderly parents. So if there was a long-term care facility that was a little bit more culturally sensitive, um, then again, there's, there's opportunities there. Um, so to be um, in a long-term care facility, just for your knowledge, you need to be 18 or older, um, act, um, be eligible for valid uh, provincial health coverage, um, be in need of 24-hour nursing care or personal care, um, require financial, um, frequent assistance with the activities of daily living, the attack, uh, activities of daily living include eating, bathing, getting dressed, uh, toileting, um, transferring, and continence. Um, require on-site supervision or monitoring to ensure your 
safety or well-being, uh, care needs which cannot be safely met in the community through public uh, funded community-based um, services or other caregiving support, or have care needs which um, can be met in a long-term care home. So uh, that, that's uh, definitely an opportunity as well. Um, there's also an opportunity where um, we've had situations here in Canada where training institutions have gone abroad. Uh, for example, Niagara College um, had set up a satellite campus in the region of Saudi Arabia. Um, so one thing that we can facilitate is if the Ugandan government's um, strategic plan, uh, we, something that we could look at, um, requires a specific skill set that Canada may be able to op offer, then perhaps we can maybe um, set up a partnership where one of our many training institutions here sets up a satellite um, um, campus in Uganda to provide the training that, um, that Ugandans could use that would propel them to where they see themselves 50 years from now. Um, South Korea, for example, I think has probably done the best uh, in terms of that approach. Um, South Korea was like any other country um, 50 some odd years ago, but they made the decision to invest heavily in technology and post-secondary education. And now they're one of the, uh, I, I think they call them the, one of the four tigers uh, when it comes to uh, technology innovation. Um, then uh, I would also say there's opportunities as well with um, the, di and this is probably a big one, and this came up when uh, we had our, our meeting with the Chamber of Commerce uh, last week. There's huge opportunities with the diaspora with various Black ethnic groups. So not just Ugandans, Black individuals across um, the GT, uh, greater Toronto area, and I would um, venture to say Canada, are eager and interested in doing business with Africa. Uganda has many, many benefits, and some of them are even um, intangible. So even if you may not be able to match uh, the salary um, demands that let's say um, the West can offer, there's so many different options um, that can be structured. And again, we can have a further meeting about this, uh, whether it's um, the housing allowance, whether it's, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, free, uh, you know, uh, additional services for your children's uh, education, um, food allowances, things like that. So um, for people here that, uh, and, and we all know that we're all going through pressure, uh, that would be a, a welcome, um, uh, um, I guess, relief from uh, some of the pressures that we experience here in um, North America. So I'm gonna just kind of conclude there, but I will just do a quick summary uh, for those that are taking notes um, so that um, you can uh, contact me at a later date. So for those that are interested, um, you can contact me either by going to my website, which is wheatfieldfinancial.com. You can email me directly at uh, maximumnetworth at gmail.com. So uh, here, my summary is this, uh, in yeah. terms of using Canadian education Canada as a permanent resident. One, you can enroll in a private boarding uh, secondary school to ensure easy access and success in the Canadian college or university. Two, if you're outside of Canada, but you get certification in your home country for uh, one of many of our high demand apprenticeship trades, this could be an easy transition to Canada. Three, with proper research or my assistance through the Maximum Education Program, um, if you select the right program um, through college or university, um, secure, you practically will get employment before you even graduate the program. Once you went from a student to um, getting employed in your field, it's, it's a fairly seamless process to become a permanent resident after that. Um, Next is uh, Ugandan investors can take advantage of the strong and relatively safe real estate market to offer student housing to uh, members of their community. Um, and again, I, I would strongly encourage uh, setting up an investment group. So whether that's 10 people that put in $10,000, whether it's four people that put in $25,000, uh, it, it just depends on what, uh, what investment opportunity you're trying to, to uh, take advantage of. 
Um, next was, um, I did briefly talk about in Canada due to the aging population, uh, research the requirement for opening a long-term care facility in the province of your choice um, to either A, fill a void um, in an underserved area of Canada, or B, to provide culturally sensitive care for your elderly, if that's something that is, um, is um, culturally uh, acceptable in the community. I, I will just conclude um, with um, the last point. The diaspora is eager to do business with Africa. The two areas that are uh, most in uh, critical need are ethnic food production and um, hair care needs. So uh, please contact me at maximumnetwork at gmail.com or visit my website, which is wheatfieldfinancial.com. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Eldon uh, Avery. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And also pass our appreciation to Judge Rochelle. She's really been awesome. We're seeing the comments here. Uh, we're going to rebroadcast this once we download it. NBS has also requested us to pres uh, sort of uh, preserve the material we are recording, so we'll be able to share that.